We must be cautious. Welcome to the Nerd Party. Hi, this is Nick Anastasiu, story editor on Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Bad Batch. And you are listening to Aggressive Negotiations. From the far reaches of an unreachable place comes a broadcast, a broadcast that you have longed to hear from Aggressive Negotiations, the Star Wars podcast on the Nerd Party Network. I am one of your mysterious hosts from the nether beyond region secret places, Jedi Master John Mills, and joining me in this weird place that nobody can find except the people that need to at certain times is Jedi Master Matthew Rushing. Matt... Did you forget to pay the electric bill again? Because why is everything dark? I why can't we at least have a nightlight or something? I don't I don't understand. I I thought I I was going to ask you why you turned on all these strobe lights. Um, I'm uh, getting a little bit sick personally. I'm, um, I'm big on atmosphere and vibe, my friend. Oh, it's very that's... important. That that's what that is. Well, it's uh, hopefully you know maybe we should put a warning then uh, for anyone. Uh, so you know, you, you, as you get the warning on on TV shows or or movies, there may be flashing lights here uh, because wow. Well, listen, you had better close the fridge door next time because you lost <laughs> me a whole batch of snow clones last week, and I'm still pretty sore about it. That's a huge cost expenditure right there, and I'm not going to the grocery store for more of them. You are. But while you're out there, if you could remind people to please give us a review on Apple Podcasts and to go ahead and reach out to us on the socials and the blah, 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 at the Jedi Masters, at Joy Nerd Party, blah, blah, all those places where you can find us. You should know them by now. And we'll mention them again some other place, inevitably. So, Matt, we find ourselves again at a crossroads of a weird topic I want to throw at you. It's not really weird. It's more of a curiosity thing, because I know this hasn't really been established, and I want to sort of like reason it out in my brain. One of the things I've always struggled with, and here we are, uh, you know, by the time this drops, well, this should drop pretty much, I think, on the day that The Rise of Skywalker was released. So it'll be like the anniversary of that. It was just, it was December 19th, right? Wasn't that when it came out or something like that? Sure. It was close to? Sure. Yeah, yeah somewhere yeah, around okay. there. Okay. I'm just going to say that. We're going to say this dropped on the same day. Guess what? If you're listening to it on that day, maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Who knows? Anyway, so, you know, the dead speak, mysterious transmission. And Mm -hmm. we know that in our world, there was a piece of this transmission heard in Fortnite, Star Wars. Okay. And it was mentioned in the novelization. But there's no real discussion about the mode of the broadcast. Like how many devices did it appear on? Was it... Was it a broadcast that took over a whole region? Did Were people flying in their ships and all of a sudden there was a broadcast through their thing? Did sound, you know, since sound travels in Star Wars space, was it just really loud? Did they just have some <laughs> loud speakers floating around in the unknown regions? So I, I kind of want to come at that, though, because uh, what do you imagine would be the delivery mechanism that would make it possible for that broadcast to be heard anywhere outside of... Well, I mean, honestly, Exegol or anybody mm-hmm. that was like tuned into the right frequency. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm going to say it's short force radio, uh, and so okay. um, th- it's a it's a special form of radio there uh, for force users, and uh, other people can also hear the transmissions, and they still exist. Uh, of course, were used during the uh, new the old Republic era when you know Jedi were at their height, and that's how they would contact one another or, or talk to one another. Of course, do their you know famous radio programs with uh, continue next week as Jedi Master Equan J finds out who murdered the prince. I like it. I like where you're going with this, baby. We got a stew going. I like this. I like this. But I don't know why I'm fixating on it and why it just suddenly came out of nowhere because I'm sitting here. This may surprise you. We're recording this for a podcast. And for people to hear this podcast, technically it's a broadcast, Mm -hmm. but you have to make the conscious decision to seek it out and get it. And that's the world we live in now where we're not driving around with radios where like and but even when people were driving around with a radio the idea of every broadcast channel being taken over you go back to broadcast tv days the station had to set up the you you know they could take it over at the same time but it was all mm-hmm. on a certain frequency and that sort of yeah. thing and obviously with a large galaxy 
I'm just trying to think like, like, is okay. it something where there would be like a mesh network or something? So there's two different ideas. One, they stole the uh, uh, technology from the Kryptonians who did this mm. in a man of steel where it took over all the screens, right? Even phones. Okay. So there's okay. that. Or the second idea is that there was the emergency empire system that was built into every single radio ship, anything mm. that, that would allow a transmission to take over, just like the emergency broadcast system takes over your mm. television every week to just test. So I like where you are with that, where there was like some sort of leftover emergency broadcast system that, of course, Sidious knew about that he exploits. Would it turn on a device like it, it would have to be something that would be standardized, put into like every device capable of picking up a broadcast then, right? Like, wouldn't it have to be? And so if he's on Exegol, was it Admiral Pride or was it General Pride? Was he a general or an admiral? Whatever. Pride. Richard E. Grant's character. Did like somebody in the First Order have to flip the switch for the broadcast to go out? Or did the broadcast show up? Because we know that Operation Cinder which has been acknowledged on screen. So we know it's like real, real. There were those robots that went out and like gave a, a you know, command. Would it all, like with this broadcast system, with how disparate the galaxy is, do you think it's possible that like an oper- Operation Cinder like bot shows up to the First Order and is like, okay, yeah, th- this robot hasn't activated in a while, but send out this broadcast. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I, I think another possibility along with this, uh, you know, in, in imperial broadcast system also comes down to the fact that, you know, you, you knew that Palpatine had hideouts all over the galaxy. We know, um, mm. we know that, of course, mm-hmm. from, uh, what we saw in the, uh, aftermath books, right. They played a big part in that. And, you know, he had all these, th- these places where they're gathering force relics and, and and all this type of stuff and so with those hidden all over the galaxy you know you could easily see how a signal could be triggered that would broadcast this to all of um the places that you wanted via the imperial broadcast system um and so i i think that could work that would that would be a very practical solution to it. I just like the fact that you're calling it the Imperial Broadcast System because that's also IBS and, you know, Irritable Bowel Syndrome, Imperial ba- Broadcast System. Like, there seems to be a nice symbolism there that uh, that lines up. I mean, it does cause Irritable Bowel Syndrome when you hear this message, so right. it makes sense. So, basically, though, we know that Pride, at least, was receiving messages from Sidious. So Pride probably had a network of people that he could activate because it seems that Pride was a Sidious loyalist nested within the First Order. So he would have had a network of people that would have, you know, triggered this. But if I recall correctly, the Emperor's broadcast also is what sent Kylo Ren in search of the Wayfinder, correct? Was that the reason he was looking for it? I believe so, yes. So if Ren hears the broadcast, then it wasn't anybody – like Ren wasn't the one that activated the signal, which has its own you know, sort of layering of questions. But wouldn't, wouldn't the Republic have moved to – I mean, I guess it, it would make sense that the Republic would not have taken out any sort of emergency broadcast system. I mean, it's already established on screen that they're like inept during the Mandalorian time frame. Which, I mean, heck, we even saw a little bit when uh, Hera goes after, yeah. uh, you know, um, Ahsoka, you know, on that mission. And, you know, yeah. you, you already see the ineptitude of, um, you know, certain senators who, you know, want to basically pull in completely and um, take care of their own and pretend like no threats in the galaxy exist anymore. But if this system still existed, and we know that the resistance is trying to get in contact with everybody, Leia would have known about this thing's existence. Would, wouldn't would she have used that to try to make contact with everybody if it were that desperate? See, that makes me wonder, like, 
you know, was this something like the Order 66 conspiracy that it's so hidden that this isn't something that anybody actually knows exists? It's just something that, you know, Palpatine has worked in to every ship system, you know, every uh, transmission system, everything without anybody knowing it in the same way he had worked into the clones this trigger to allow him to at a moment's notice Mm -hmm. trigger them all to you know flip the switch and murder jedi and so I, i i see how this idea that palpatine could speak from beyond at least that's what everybody thinks you know somehow palpatine returned so his message comes forth and it's 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 a reminder i think of you know i, I one of the, the the deeper things i'm thinking in this and, and this is strange that i'm even thinking deep on this um but it really goes to show this idea of how careful you have to be of building on something that was evil Mm -hmm. like the the idea of oh oh we can still use those people you know like especially i'm thinking of you know what happens in ahsoka right you know we we have these people who are working behind the scenes for the enemy because everybody's like well we just can't get rid of everybody that was a part of the empire and not really vetting anyone and i think this just creates a serious problem you know and especially you know, we know how devious Palpatine was in the first place, how much he worked to control every single little thing and think of every nuance that could happen. So he was ready for it at a moment's notice. And so, you know, the the thought process that something like this could exist so that Palpatine could basically have his people flip the switch and he could broadcast in the entire galaxy. Hey, I'm back, you know, uh. <laughs> Like uh, Randy Quaid in in uh, Independence Day, um, you know, um, yeah. I just I see this as being like completely plausible for that person. Okay. See, the thing is, two of the things that you said have triggered my de- oh, my constant desire to like make a you know like a little comedy bit out of something. Where number one, you know, like the I'm back thing, it's like, was there a holographic component to this where it like wasn't just audio? So like somebody has a holographic thing on their thing and like all of a sudden the little emperor pops up and is like, boo, ha ha, I'm back. And they like disappears. So it was like, what? What just happened? Right. But additionally, given the fact that we know that there are a thousand thousand worlds and therefore a thousand thousand species out there, was he subtitled or was he auto translated? When it goes out there, I know that this is a question that could apply to just about anything that happens in Star Wars, but was it just him speaking what we acknowledge as basic, which, you know, we hear as English? Mm -hmm. Or was there like an option to hit a number and be like, you know, to hear this message again in Mon Cala, press two. And, you know, that that sort of thing for for people who are out there. Or do you think Palpatine just went went for broke and was just like, "Eh, if you can't hear, you understand what I'm saying. So like... Because think about it, 30 years later, all of a sudden you hear this broadcast mm-hmm. and it's a voice you've never yeah. heard before. And somebody just be like, well, who's that? What what happened? You know, like his voice wouldn't mean anything to somebody who hadn't been alive during the time period, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it, what would happen is it would, you, you know, your messaging system would say, incoming message from Emperor Palpatine to hear this message in Mon Cala, mm-hmm. press one. To hear this message in Twi'lek, press two. To hear this message exactly. in Ewok, press three. To hear this message in Kashyyyk, press four. You know, a Wookiee, press I, four. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, it would be yeah. a really long list. And if you missed it, it's like, to repeat this list, press right? 12, you know? <laughs> and, it's like, and, and it's like Palpatine is like sitting there holding a piece of paper, <laughs> like for each one. And then like by like the thousandth, he's like, eh. You know, no, see, now I've got like the robot chicken emperor in my head where he's like, you know, it's like, OK, and uh, we need that now in Rodian. Ugh, uh, can't somebody else read it? Can't just somebody else read it? You know, um, obviously, we're ha- we're having a little bit of fun with it. But the thing is, it's like it is something where I would always want to square it because this transmission. Now, I, I say it flippantly a minute ago, but it's 30 years after the war has ended. Palpatine's voice hasn't been heard since he died. 
So somebody who's 20 who hears this thing where it's like, at last, the Sith are back. We're going to take our revenge. They would be like, what the hell is that? Right? Like, and just, yeah. Why would they pay I, I any just, attention to it? So I'm expecting that it sounds kind of like what uh, you get in The Princess Bride, where he's like, this is Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It's been a while since I've talked. This is Emperor Palpatine. Yeah. Do it. Yes, exactly. Listen to I, this you know, message. So, so okay. So, I mean, there, there, there's that aspect to it. But I think it would actually be, uh, here's free story idea for you, Disney. Not that they listen to me anymore, whatever, whatever. But wouldn't it be a sincerely interesting story to follow, whether in book form or comic book form or something, there would be people who would be quote unquote conspiracy theorists post Endor who would say, nah, that was false flag. The emperor never died. He just went into hiding. And wouldn't it be interesting to have a story like that where one of these people feels incredibly justified and they're like, I, I've been telling you. I said so. You ended Thanksgiving or you ended Life Day dinner early because you did. You were sick of hearing me go on about it five years ago. But I told you he's still alive. Like, wouldn't that be a really interesting sort of story to like have somebody feel vindicated by the fact that the Emperor's voice comes back where they're like, I told you, I told you he wasn't really dead. And I've been saying it for years. Exactly. Exactly. I, but that is an interesting type of story because the thing is, then you, you wind up having – You know, Star Wars loves, uh, you know, telling these sorts of relatable stories where, like, you know, sometimes the conspiracy theory isn't the wacky thing. It's more of a spoiler alert. Wouldn't that be interesting? I think so. You know, obviously, we've been talking mostly humorously about this whole idea. And, you know, I I think it's it's so fascinating because as we're recording this, you know, we just had an interview with Adam Driver come out where he was talking about, you know, how the direction for his character changed based off of where originally um, they were going to go with with his character, which is that he was not going to have a redemption arc. In fact, he was going to basically be the antithesis to to um, Darth Vader. And then, you know, two, that there were actually thoughts of having Rey be connected to uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi at one point and before they finally decided on in the end, you know, her being a a Palpatine. And so – I think it just goes to show that, you know, there was a thought process for this whole thing and just how messed up everything got because of the change in director and because, you know, they didn't take their time and really allow somebody to come up with a story that canvassed three movies and then they – you know, worked on the details in the same way George did, right? Like George didn't know every single detail, but he did know how it started and how it ended. You know, he knew the, uh, and, and, and you could massage the details from there and still get to where he wanted to go. It's just, it's too bad that that didn't happen because, you know, the sequel trilogy itself is not full of, of a, a ton of terrible ideas. It's just not well executed. And I think, you know, that's just the place that we kind of end up with it. But, you know, with this, like, it's a funny story point in the sense of the way we've been discussing it. But it's also something to which, you know, when you hear that that can happen, what we've seen in the Star Wars galaxy you already automatically buy it because you've already seen stuff like this. I, I think immediately uh, any Star Wars fan's brain goes to Order 66, right? The the fact mm-hmm. that you can have a, an order that goes out to all the clones relatively quickly to have them turn. So the idea that the Emperor has this set up so that he could have a broadcast go out to whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted um, – this just seems complete within the sheave wheelhouse, you know, to to want yeah. to have up his sleeve, or yeah, you know, in his cloning does. tank. It does, man, and it's it, the thing is, this is the space where I, I've never been bashful about saying I don't like that they br- they brought back Palpatine. I don't think it was the right move by a country mile. I really think it was a grossly miscalculated error, but. The fact that we can still operate within the space and throw some of these ideas out and try to ameliorate it a bit 
is why I think some of the material that's coming out will be successful in making the sequel trilogy experience feel a little bit more organically tied to everything. Right. Right. And that's, you know, we've talked about it before, how Star Wars telling stories non-sequentially from the get go makes it possible for us to go back and say, oh, okay, well, here's an additional part of the story. We go, okay, all right, all right. Now I'll buy, you know, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But it's just, yeah, man, I, I think, I think where I really fixate is on the conspiracy theory people that could have a really interesting story told about them. I want to go down to the book publisher and be like, look, I got a book idea. Just, well, it, you, know, you know, you have to pay it, a lot of money. Just, just enough that I could just like take two months off from work. Uh, I'll do my well, best. You know? What's interesting about this whole thing though, is, is you and I have both read, you know, shadows of the Sith. Right. And in a lot of ways, yeah. that's kind of what that book is trying to do. It's trying mm-hmm. to find a way to bring together a lot of the questions that were raised by the sequel trilogy that weren't answered and kind of pull pieces together, you know? And and so I, I think that that's interesting that that was a book that happened because, you know, once it ended, there were still so many questions that people had. And it, it makes me wonder, you know, obviously too, and, and I think we've talked about this before, but and I think most fans have thought about this idea of, you know, you have – the Mandalorian series and Ahsoka and all these things happening in, in that time period. And they are building into, you know, where we're going. We've already seen connections in that, right? We've seen a lot of connections, you know, these little threads of, of things that lead us into the, the sequel trilogy. And so, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm continually interested to see the ways in which they will maybe find and and have a possibility of these things making more sense in the end. But I, I don't know. Who knows? But it is fun to be able to have these kind of conversations because I do think, you know, as we've done, we've talked about the holiday special and, and all sorts of crazy things that have happened in Star Wars over the years. Um, and, you know, not everything's a surefire winner. Even in my beloved Clone Wars, you know, there there are still some episodes that I'm not huge fans of, but we find ways to enjoy it all or at least be able to think about it. And and so, yeah, to, to be able to have a discussion about, you know, how Palpatine was able to contact the entire galaxy at the beginning of The Rise of Skywalker. I mean, that's a legit question. It It is. And before we start going down another road where I'm like, well... You know, if somebody had an answering system, was it just like a message left on their machine? So like you're in the shower and you come out and it's like, oh, there's a, me- a message from Palpatine. You have one what? message waiting for you. Yeah. This is Emperor what? Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, you played a prank on me again. What's going on? But if people want to reach out to you, Matt, and broadcast to you their imminent evil plans so that everybody can get ready for them and try to thwart you yet again, uh, where can they find you online? Well, you caught me monologuing. Uh, well, you could find me all <laughs> over uh, at social media under the name Matt Rushing 2 Of course, here on the network, outside of aggressive negotiations, you'll find Owl Post, where I talk with Drea Kaufman about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series, one chapter at a time. Uh, you can also find me on the TFM network with a bunch of shows. The 602 Club is the main place there. We're just enjoying all of the fandoms we love. John's a frequent guest. You can also find me there doing literary treks, The Orb, Warp 5, Saddle Up, and The Artifact. Tango. Uh, but John, you know, maybe people want to do a side by side comparison of your voice and Emperor Palpatine's. Where would they find you? Well, uh, they would find me on Exico. I mean, you would find me online as Kessel Junkie. Isn't it called me- X now? Ooh, that's a. Mm. Ooh, oh my mm. gosh. Just saying. Oh. Okay, so the first thing is the mo- yes, a social media app in the Star Wars galaxy gets updated. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got some ideas here. Anyway, <laughs> uh, find me as Kessel Junkie out there. And you can find me here on the network co-hosting another show called House Lights with Tristan Riddell and Darren Moser, where we look at the direct, the works of directors because films are fun to talk about. But something else that's fun is going and uh, removing all of the secret broadcasting stuff from all the equipment in my house and from the Jedi Temple, which is going to take some time. So... uh Master Rushing, I think it's time to close these negotiations. 
John, negotiations are closed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.